The next thing we're going to do is a panel discussion of executives, female leaders who have been in the arena for many of them for many, many years. And what we're going to do is take some of these broad ideas about the art of leadership for women and bring them to the work day and the work life of everybody here in the audience. So I'm going to ask at this point our uh, panelists to come on and join us on these uh, kind of rickety director's chairs. It's a bit of a gymnastics act to, to uh, load onto them, but I'm sure we, we are well. Come on in. All right, I'm going to introduce our panelists uh, one by one, beginning with Peggy Garrity immediately to my left. Peggy is the Senior Vice President of Reputation and Brand with ATB Financial. I got that right, right? I did, okay. Unfortunately, there is no one from ATB in the audience today. They are here, you're big fans. Uh, Peggy, uh, prior to this role, was the president of her own communications firm, and she has worked in the area of strategic communications with clients all across Alberta for many, many years. She's also written a number of thought-leading reports in the area of health, finance, justice, and social justice. She serves on boards like the Edmonton Symphony and the Children's Wish Foundation. She has two sons and two granddaughters. Welcome, Peggy. I have a question I want to ask you before we get to our next panelist. What is one thing that you would say has resonated for you so far today? You know, the, the, when Liz was talking about, uh, oh, both of them in a way talked about vulnerability from different perspectives. When Liz was talking about, you know, just leaping in and, uh, and not knowing what you're doing. I think that's kind of been my whole career. <laughs> I talk about winging it. So that's, that's it, just winging it with more confidence. Right. Proof point that it works. Absolutely. All right, Peggy. Our next panelist is Simone Abarello, but I need you to pronounce it in the appropriate Italian way. Albarello. With the hand. With, with the, the hand. hand. The that's spaghetti important. alla carbonara. However, I'm Brazilian, not But you're Brazilian. Italian. So you have to say, obrigado, Albert. How would you pronounce it if you were talking to someone who's a Portuguese speaker? Simone Albarello. Fantastic. I love it. <laughs> love it. So Simone is uh, Director of Finance with Dell Canada, and she has been in Canada since 2013, leading the cross-functional finance teams at Dell. Uh, prior to that, she read strategy implementation and was also the commercial controller for the company in Brazil. Before that, Simone worked at RBS Media and TNT Logistics. And she has an 11-year-old daughter named, what is your daughter's name? Sofia. Sofia. Sofia Alberero. And did you teach her the hand gesture? Always. Always. Of course. It's very important. It's very a tradition. Important. Louise Wilson, our uh, third panelist, partner with the human capital practice at Deloitte. Uh, Louise has 20 years of experience in functional human resources and consulting. She holds a master's of uh, public management from the University of Alberta and is a chirp a certified human resource professional. Her family is international. Live it. Your Skype calls must be outrageous. Louise, you've got three kids. Where are they living? And you have to tell us why they're living there because the reasons are so interesting. So I have our oldest son, David. He is a millennial and he works for a virtual American company and has chosen to live in Costa Rica on the beach where he can surf. Nice. Nice. And the other two kids? <clears throat> Our middle daughter, Rachel, is pursuing a PhD at the University of California in Santa Barbara, in enjoying the California sun. And our youngest daughter is going to an international school in London um, just for an experience. When will you have everybody together again? We're going to meet in France at the end of June, all of us. As one does. Just meeting in France, as one does. Well, thank you to all three of you for being here. Uh, Peggy, I want to start with you. The focus of our panel discussion is going to be on what's next for the art of leadership. So, of course, that requires us to get a sense of the what's now in that environment. What would you say uh, about characterizing leadership for women today in 2015? I think it's, uh, it's encouraging. I, I'm inspired by, by sitting here and watching these women. To be, to be very honest, when I started my career, I think there would have been a pretty small room out there. 
Right. The room's gotten very big, and there are lots of women in leadership roles right from the top to, to people that are just starting off in their careers. So I think it's inspiring. I think there are more opportunities than ever before. Mm. Louise, what would you add to the state of things today? I definitely agree with um, what Peggy said. The one thing that I have reflected on is the fact that we have choices, which is really amazing when you think about women in other generations. So for that, I am very grateful. However, um, I think that we still have a ways to go in terms of creating an environment for not just women to succeed, but for all people with ambition to succeed. One of the big themes for workers in organizations globally is work-life balance. But when it comes to the question of gender, we know statistically and anecdotally that women tend to shoulder more of the household duties than men. And that there are lots of exceptions to that, but that is uh, not an inaccurate assertion. Simone, you have a daughter. When you think about work-life balance as a mom and modeling behavior for your daughter, how do you think about that? So let, let me tell you that uh, we, um, when I think about my daughter and the different perspective that she has because of I'm a working mother, um, I'm very excited about what this gener generation is, is going to bring to the work, to the workplace. So um, my my daughter, my, my own mother, did not work when uh, most of the time that I was a child, and 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 she would do the whole housework thing. Um, my daughter doesn't know any different than having working parents full time. And that's a different perspective. And she has to be participative. And I would say in Canada even more, because in Brazil we would have help at home and all that. In Canada I'm loving because my husband and my daughter, they're all participating into that. And this is a different perspective for her in terms of balancing work and, 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 and home life, right? And, and, and I can see, you know, small um, um, signs of leadership coming from that, right. right? Just because she has to fight for her own hours at home, for my attention, right? And, uh, and I'm super proud of this attitude of her. And, and again, I think this generation will come into the workplace with different perspectives and face different challenges mm -hmm. that we face today. Peggy, you have always worked, you said, when we had our conversation, and you have two kids who are now adults and out there in the world. What uh, skills or coping mechanisms or things did you do, especially in those early years, that you would say worked? Now, I'm making the assumption that some of it worked because you're here and you're sane, largely. Virtually. <laughs> at least in appearance. I think. You know, it's, it, as you were talking, I was thinking it was, uh, it's been similar for me in my life. My, my sons just expected that that's what their mom did. Um, it, you know, it's just what you get used to. It's just the way that our family functioned. Uh, my husband has always been extremely supportive of me, uh, you know, from the time I, I went, I'm one of those people that got married, silly people, when you're in university and have uh, been married ever since. But uh, so I had my kids very young, and so we were just kind of making it up mm -hmm. as you go. And you have, to, you have to give yourself permission to not necessarily do all the other things that the moms do. I have to tell you one, I have very cheeky sons, both of them, and one of them. You know, you get the Mother's Day little cookbook thing with all of the recipes, your mom's favorite recipe, and, and my son put the phone number for the pizza place. <laughs> uh, so you just... Now, it, did you laugh? I laughed. You did laugh? I did laugh. You weren't offended or...? No, because it was true. Right. <laughs> it was true, and you thought, I'm going to order an extra large pepperoni just for you. Absolutely. That's great. I think my sons learned a lot from that, uh, that, uh, that they are now grown men. Um, one is the father of my two amazing granddaughters, and he's a wonderful father. And I think he is partly that because 
he knows that uh, that fathers are expected to do a lot more than what they used to in the past. Louise, what's next in the area of work-life balance? Or you've got a phrase that you call life harmony. Is that correct? Yeah, life harmony. I love that. I love that. There is so much talk about flex work and you know a lot of different initiatives out there. What do you think is next? What needs to happen next? So I'm going to just code a little bit of research from our Human Capital Trends report put out by Deloitte. And last year, um, one of the trends was the overwhelmed employee. And this year, that trend has evolved to simplification of work. And I think if we're really going to get to the heart of life harmony, we have to address the demands that we, we place on our employees. There's only so much time in a day, no matter how organized or flexible you are. And, and so I think we have to start questioning um, some fundamental principles that are driven a lot by technology, like the responsiveness to email. I, I, we'll just leave it at that. Right. You know, who's in charge of your day, you or everybody else? And so I think as organizations, we need to really get to the bottom of that and put people in control of their day and their work and allow them to make their own choices about where they spend their time. How do you model that as someone who is senior in a consulting organization, balancing <clears throat> family, home, and also client demands, which I would better not always in your control? The client demands are the toughest, um, but we do tell our, our team members that as long as you respectfully explain to your client what your limitations are, generally speaking, because they're people, they understand. So it's just giving them the courage to have an honest dialogue with your client. But sometimes that's difficult and it's a skill that we have to develop in people. In terms of myself personally as, as a leader, I tell my people what my boundaries are. So I don't often work on weekends. I just, I work really hard during the week, sometimes 12 hours a day, crazy morning hours. Um, but I don't do that on the weekend and they know that. So if they need my help or attention on the weekend, they need to give me a heads up. And I think the key to that is just negotiating that with people and making it clear to them what they need to do to get your attention at any point in time. Simone, I want to talk about uh, career progression. And there is, there are perceptions about how women are about promotions and new roles, and then there are practices. Uh, we talked a little bit about today how women might be more reticent to stand up and have the confidence to leap forward into that role, whereas the guy would sort of, you know, hook their thumbs in their belt and say, <laughs> bring it on, I got this, no even if they were completely unqualified for the role. Does that view resonate with you? Do you think there is a difference in gender in how women approach career? Absolutely. So last year, I was on the audience of this very same event in Toronto. And what most resonated to me was the uh, talk from Katie Kay. And she is a BBC journalist and author of the Confidence Code. Uh, and she talked about the statistics about men versus women applying for the job. So if I remember the, the numbers right, it's um, men will apply for the job if they have 50% of the requirements, while a woman will apply if they have 80% or more of the requirements. And um, she, she talked not only about the, the, the statistic, but also how she faced times when she lacked confidence. And that surprised me because she was the superb role model of a successful woman, and it resonated so much with me. My own experience when I was offered this job, I, I hesitate a lot, and I question myself in different aspects. Am I ready? Do I have what it takes? Am I at the right age? Many, many aspects, you, you name it, I question. And um, my family want to go, wanted to go globally, and Canada was top of our list. And also, I, I wouldn't pass on the opportunity, so I took it. But I took it, and guess what happened? I continue questioning myself. 
in the job, if I have what it takes to make it. And that was the biggest mistake. That was what almost caused me to fail, Qu continued questioning myself. And interesting that my husband moved to Canada about the same time, and we both got new jobs. And my perspective was all about the, 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 the things that I didn't know, right? I don't know the culture. I don't know the business in here. I don't, I don't know the, the, I don't have the network. And my husband had completely different perspective, how much everything that is different in here than in Brazil could help him to succeed on the, on the, on the role. So eventually I came out of this, uh, this situation with help from my husband, help from my boss, help from mentors as well, um, as much as my own skills, right, who got, to, who got me the job at the first place, but was very painful process that uh, took me longer to, to get out of it. Peggy, how can we have this be a less painful process? Is the work, and I'm, I, this is a tough question, is the work about working with female leaders to address the confidence gap, for lack of a better phrase, uh, or is it organizationally? We need to think about how we pull people into new roles in a different way. It probably is a little bit of both. I, you know, I think there are things definitely that organizations can do uh, to tap people on the shoulder that, that you know are, are, um, are people with potential that, you know, I know in my own, uh, my own uh, career, it has been people that have tapped me on the shoulder and said, you, you should do this, you can do this. Uh, so I think there's a role for that. It's, it's probably more of a personal role than an organizational role per se. But I think the other thing is, is to, as women, you know, we do need to find ways to believe in ourselves. I, I read over the weekend a really interesting interview with uh, Colleen Johnson, who is the CFO of TD Bank. And she was talking about, she's been leading, TD Bank has done some very successful things for their women. And so she was talking about, now they've done all the program kinds of things. They've done all the organizational things. Now the next challenge is to get women to believe in themselves. Um, I don't pretend to know how the, the answer is to that, but I think, you know, if listening this morning, there's definitely some clues there. You know, there's, there's clues that, you know, we just sometimes have to jump in. And, you know, I, I know I am the one who, I'm, I'm like you, that's what I call the dark hours in, you know, th between three and five in the morning when you, you, you wake up and you doubt yourself and all of those bad, tragic things are going to happen. And then you wake up in the morning and think, what in the world was I thinking of? And it's, you know, I think women are susceptible to that. And I think that vulnerability will always be there. It's what we do with it. It's realizing that, I think Liz said something this morning, that, that it's not that dangerous. You're just leaping off the ground. I thought that was, because we feel like we're leaping off cliffs. And, and if we just realize that, it's, it's not that dangerous that uh, we can pick ourselves up if something goes wrong and, and people are not going to judge you nearly as much as we think, we think they would. Louise, sometimes things do go wrong in workplaces or they don't work as one would like. It's not just confidence in isolation, it's consequence in an environment that is disrespectful or not conducive uh, to women leaders. What is there to be done on this question of a respectful workplace. And I, and I do connect it to what we have all as Canadians really been listening about since the Gian Gomeshi story. That's been topical. We talk about it. We notice about it. We notice it. And you've been really trying to do some work to find out why women don't speak up when they're in an environment where respect isn't present. Yeah, so I um, had the privilege of hearing Arlene Dickinson speak just after the Gian Gomeshi scandal. And she, it was at a Woman of Influence luncheon that Deloitte sponsors, and her challenge was power to speak. 
And so I decided to accept the challenge and I hosted um, roundtable discussions with staff at all levels of consulting in Alberta. But we used a, a tool that allows you to reply to questions anonymously, so it was a safe environment. And the idea was twofold. One, to see if we had any blind spots in terms of, you know, bad behavior in the workplace. And the second was to understand why people wouldn't talk about it. Thankfully, um, nothing terribly alarming came out of the sessions in terms of bad behavior that's gone unchecked. But I learned a lot about how respect actually manifests itself in the workplace. And what was interesting is the biggest form of disrespect that people felt was time. People taking advantage of you in terms of your time and, and not respecting your choices as an individual about where you want to spend your time. That was a little nugget. But t to the point about why women don't speak out or why people don't speak out is, um, interestingly enough, the, the predominant finding was that they are afraid to be um, difficult, that somehow if they complain about the environmental conditions, they're weak, there'll be you know, high maintenance employees and that is going to badly reflect on them and their career. That was the predominant reason, which I found to be quite, quite interesting. So what we learned is that we have a lot to do about creating the safe places for conversations between people because mostly they wanted to deal with it themselves. That was the other predominant thing that came out. I want to deal with it. I don't want to look like I'm a big complainer, but I don't know how. So if you could just point me to someone who could help me, then I'll deal with it. Interesting. Now, Simone, what, what is different Canada versus Brazil on the question of disclosure, relationship building, and comfort? Because I think there's an interesting insight uh, as we apply it to leadership for women in Canada. So specific for leadership for women, I think people bring this perspective that the, the Latin America is more macho than, you know, the North America. I actually find that um, there are, there are some positive perspectives going from um, um, in, in the Latin America for women. In terms of um, uh, relationship, inclusion, um, diversity, I found that it's more valid in Latin America than in, in North America. And the other thing is, um, I found it here to be um, um, a culture that it's more direct, more assertive, and less um, about feelings. <laughs> and, 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 and that's something you associate more with men than women. Um, I, I don't just like it at all. I actually, I like it. Uh, but when we, we, we think about women and men aspects uh, and what they bring to the table, I found that all these feminine aspects of uh, relationship mm -hmm. and uh, inclusion, they were very valuable in Latin America. Was there a time here in your role in Canada where you kind of stepped in it and you were just felt too direct in a work environment? Because, you know, Canadians were very apologetic. I'm sorry for even asking <laughs> you that question is the stereotype of, uh, did you find that you had to n have a nuance to your so behavior? I, I found I had to, to, uh, to have a nuance to my behavior, but differently because I was um, invading the person, personal life of uh, uh, the, the, the team that worked to me that was not really welcome. Right. And, um, and, and that's the aspect that I had to kind of step back and be a little bit more respectful about their you know, life and time, as you mentioned. Peggy, you referenced the changing role of men. And I would love, I mean, obviously you have seen so much change for women in your career, but what have you noticed has changed for men in the workplace and in the home life that they have now? I, I think it's become more complicated for men. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a good, a good thing. Um, you know, I, I'm one of those people who loves Mad Men, uh, but... The TV the, series, the TV, not the... No, 
not the <laughs> dating archetype. No. <laughs> Mad Men, the series, John Hamm. Yes, Got it. absolutely. Got it. Uh, so that's the stereotype of what men's lives used to be like. And I think now I'm really fortunate to work with some outstanding young men on, on my team, a number of whom have just, their fam they've just had babies. And it's just joyful to see them. To, they come into work and they, they just talk to me about their babies and, and what they're Do you they're sometimes doing. notice that they have vomit in their hair? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that a messy. wondrous <laughs> example of equality that the guys can show up at work with vomit in their hair from their newborn? That absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, uh, in the workplace, they're um, they see more the complexities of things that go on. They're not just, you know, task focused, like get it done and these are deadlines and whatever. I think. I think there's a growing understanding among men and also women, of course, that the, the most difficult part of leadership is leading people. That's, you know, I think most people can lead a product to, from start to finish. You can lead a project. It's leading people that is the complicated part of leadership. And I think men uh, have, have learned different ways of, of leading people, and it, it is more complicated than it used to be in a really good way. Louise, your take on that question. What's changed for men? Well, I think the biggest thing, and Peggy touched on it, is what I would call sharing and parenting. Um, some, I, I think, younger men have a, a greater desire and maybe even it's a societal expectation now to share in parenting. Um, but what's interesting is I, I work for a firm that has long historical traditions and I'm, you know, will truthfully say that the large majority of people and men in senior leadership roles have um, uh, wives who stay at home. and. Um, that had given them the freedom to give it all, you know, work all the time, just do what it takes because there's a big payoff at the end and the whole family will benefit from that. So there are still men in our firm who use that formula. That's the tried and true formula to success. And what's changing is that we're starting to challenge that and say, you know, effort is not what's going to, um, get ahead. It's modeling our values and our behaviors that we want to instill in our culture. We're very, very committed to inclusion in, in our culture. And so we're starting to call out people who are high potentials, N not, you know, mostly men, but some women too, and say, take it down a notch here. You know, you've got time. Just spend, you know, make sure that your life is balanced. Figure out what your values are. You know, how are you going to not wake up when you're 50 years old and hate your life? So we are in including those kinds of expectations into high performance in our company, and I think that's a big difference. Well, it's a big difference because there's certainly a currency in our culture to be the one who has 500 emails and who has to work the weekends and carries the weight of the world in home and at work. It sounds like you're almost saying that that currency isn't valid here anymore. Well, I, I don't think it's healthy. And we're, you know, when you think about bringing the whole person to work, you know, your health and your balance and your, you know, demeanor is all really mm. important. And um, so we're, we're, we want people to be their authentic selves and, and be fulfilled in their lives and give them the flexibility and permission to do whatever it takes. But the other thing we're challenging is, because we work in a very competitive environment, I don't know how many of you, like we win our work, we, you know, everything is measured, it's, it's a very competitive environment. And so for people, especially women who want to combine a career and family in a firm like ours, if, if they feel that taking, leaving work at 
five o'clock because they have to meet their childcare commitments is gonna be a disadvantage, they opt out. So we have to level the playing field by saying, you know, everybody should go home at five o'clock. We're turning off give, the electricity. Yeah, to give people permission to leave and, and to live. Simone, I want to ask you about mentorship. It's something that we talk about in leadership uh, writ large. Were you the beneficiary of a mentor in your career? For sure. And who, I, who was it? And what did they, what I did have they provide? Many, yeah. I have many mentors. So um, I have mentors that are technical mentors that can be either, you know, a member of my team. So I, I can learn something more like technical. I have mentors that are more like behavior. I, I don't know what to do in a situation. I would go for them. But I'll tell you that the mentors that are most valuable for me was the ones that pushed me, was more like the, uh, the, my promoters and also the ones that gave me challenge. When I look back at my career, uh, the pivotal moments are based in challenges, in projects, and things that I didn't know how to do and I managed out doing. Um, and, uh, and I never, I, I, I thought about that, I never really, put my hand up for the projects. It's always a sponsor or a mentor that, or even a boss that gave me that. And that was what made, what made me who I am, what helped me to be what I am. Peggy, some of their uh, attendees may not have had the benefits or don't currently have the benefits of a mentor. What would you say to them in terms of finding that person and engaging in that kind of a relationship? Formal or informal? I think it's always great uh, to identify people that you admire and respect. Mm. And, you know, they don't, I, I'm really fortunate. There are lots of women in, at ATB that, that come and tap me on the shoulder and say, you know, I'd like to just sit and talk with you and have a conversation. And I'm, I'm just, I'm thrilled to do that. I don't pretend to have answers. I think if you're seeking a mentor for answers, for how do I do this, that might not be the right path uh, because I, d I know I don't have the answers. Um, uh, but, but to listen, people to learn from, as, as you mentioned, the, the mentors that I've had in my life are people that believed in me more than I believed in myself. Mm -hmm. And so does that mean it's an impossible request to make of someone? Can, can you make a request of them? I think you can make a request of them to learn from them, to listen, to, to give you hints at times, but, uh, but I think we all, we all have to find our own path. Mm. And so I sure wouldn't want necessarily for me to say, this is the path that I followed therefore that's the path that you followed because I've never had a path. You know, I, I have a master's degree in sociology and I have no training in the th stuff that I do every day. So I would never advise anybody to do that. That's, you know. <laughs> Does your boss know that you are completely <laughs> unqualified? Yes, he does. He does, <laughs> and you're not completely unqualified. No. <laughs> Uh, Louise, how do you think about mentorship uh, in the consulting work that you do and the organization that you're a part of? Well, first, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about personal mentors for me and then, then what I'm doing to support other people. But um, Sheryl Sandberg in her book, Lean In, says you don't find your mentors, they find you. And so for the longest time, I... I wasn't found, or at least I didn't think I was found, <laughs> in terms of one or two people that I really felt were guiding my career. Until very recently, I realized that I have had a mentor for almost all of my formative career years, and that individual is my husband. He, we met at work, and he, he found me, and he is more committed to my career than I am sometimes. So he always says to me, why would you stop now? That's all he says, why would you stop now? So um, I say the same thing to, to people in my organization, not just women, but men. I have actually a number of um, 
high potential men who, who often seek out my guidance and advice because n not all men are the same. They're not all the madmen. So they struggle too with how do you deal with competition in this environment because it makes me feel uncomfortable. And how, Louise, is it, how, do, how can I share in parenting? You know, my, my wife is expecting a baby. What should I be doing? And you know, all these unexpected questions come. But I think that um, I, I, that's probably the best part of my job is, is the opportunity to support people and just help them deal with these life challenges. And it's definitely an important role that all leaders should play in organizations. And I encourage my um, male colleagues to get involved in those conversations. I, uh, as the only um, partner in consulting, as a woman, at, just in Deloitte and Alberta, not in general, um, there's a tendency to want to make me the spokesperson for all of those issues. So I'm pushing back a little bit to say, no, you know, everybody, we got to share in the load because this is really important. This is the next generation of leaders. Great. I'm going to come out into the audience in just a minute to get your questions and comments. So I'll be wandering around with the microphone. Just raise your hand, and uh, I'd love you to participate in this conversation. But before I do that, I want to ask you each, and I'm going to begin with you, Peggy, for your number one piece of advice for a young female leader. And I know everyone's different. Their issues, their challenges, their hopes and dreams are different. But what would be one thing that you would say would be the first thing that would come to your mind? Two words, think yes. Uh, because it's just so easy to come up with all the reasons why you shouldn't do exactly what you were talking about, Simone. That's a natural thing, it's going to happen, but, but if you think yes, you just put yourself open to the possibilities. It's just, it is, you know, it's like we heard this morning, if you're not willing to put yourself in the arena, it really isn't anybody else's fault. You have to put yourself in the arena you have to think yes, and you have to find a way to, to make it so. Simone, one piece of advice. It would, I, I would say it's um, trust yourself and take challenge, and the opposite also work. Take challenge and trust yourself. Mm, that's great. Louise, for you. So my theme is uh, perseverance. So we're all going to face uh, difficulties and challenges in our career, but what I've learned is that you have to put yourself in the place of highest potential for you. So that means seek out the conditions that will allow you to succeed and be really, really um, deliberate about that. That's fantastic. Well, we're going to test one of the theories here, or not one of the theories, one of your recommendations, and that is about yes. So if you have a question, I want you to just raise your hand and say, yes, I'll ask that question, despite the fact that there are 1,500 people in the room. So I'm going to see the first hand I see is the first questioner, and you will receive 1,000 good karma points. Where is our first question coming from? Our first question, our first question. The confidence to just ask a question. Oh my gosh, you're going to make me run. OK, I can run. I can totally run. All right, if you could stand up. Thank you very much. And you get 1,000 good karma points, which you can use at your leisure. Your question is? Hi, everyone. Um, my question is, what are you most proud of when it comes to your career? What's, what are you most proud of? Peggy, why don't we start with you? Wow, that's really hard. Um, my family, for sure. I have two amazing sons, um, I, and a husband, of course, I should mention him. Uh, uh, but I think I'm also most proud of the opportunities that I've had in my career. I've, I truly am blessed. I, I have had opportunities to work on amazing projects where I learned so much that I worked with brilliant people. Um, I, I just, I'm truly blessed. I think that's, that's what I'm the most proud of. I've been from 
a job to owning my own business for 15 years to having a job again, and uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to have done all of that. Simone, for you. For me, it's not about a project or something that I did, but it's about the impact that I have in uh, other people's lives. So when I can you know, be open with someone in my team and, and, and see that what, whatever I said, right or wrong, made a difference for that person and make the person better or um, help the person to get out of a struggle, that's what I'm more proud of. Louise. I would say that how much I've grown, um, like the woman that you see sitting here before you is quite different from the woman who started her career. And um, I, I, that, that makes me feel very proud that you can have a vision and then, you know, despite whatever happens, you know, get to a place where, wow, look at what I learned and look at what I did. Whatever that, whatever it is for you, that, that for me, that's what, what I'm most proud of. But also, the first thing that came to my mind was my daughter. Fantastic. That's great. Okay, our next question, if you could stand. Uh, this might be sort of a bit of a tough question. It relates to hours of work and the whole life harmony concept, which I really like. I'm a mom who works full time. My husband is a stay at home dad to our two kids. Um, and for me, I actually find that that makes it harder for me to put time into my career because I have the whole mom guilt thing happening and the need to go home at the end of the day and relieve him. Um, so my question really is around how much you think women need to put in in terms of time. And I hear you talking about the need to have balance and boundaries and so on. But Louise, I also heard you say that you work 12 hour days. So I appreciate your weekend boundary. Um, but for me, it's not possible or desirable to put in 12 hour days. Um, my youngest is two. And if I did that, I would literally never see him. So how do you, each of you or any of you find uh, or what would you suggest in terms of how much we need to put in in terms of time in order to be successful and advance in our careers? Thank you for your question. Louise, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for calling out the 12-hour days because um, I, I didn't, it was when my daughter was little and, and the other kids, we have a blended family, were with us uh, definitely. I actually worked a reduced work week at that point in time. I'm just in a different place right now with my family that I, I have the ability to put in the time. Um, you know, am I, does that make me you know, more effective? That's a very good question, and that's how I'm going to answer the question to you, is, is really to focus on what it is that you need to get done and get that done, and then observe those boundaries. So your boundaries are getting home to relieve your husband, which is perfectly uh, reasonable boundary. Um, it, so it's just being really clear on what your priorities are and focusing your energy and time on those. Um, I've often said that some of the most um, effective and efficient people in our in our organization are the ones with young kids at home because they have no choice. They have to go, but they still manage to get things done. So um, I, I think, you know, just just be true to, to your values. Peggy, is there anything you want to add or Simone? Uh, the first thing I'd say is that please Guilt is the worst emotion that, that women especially suffer from. I'm living proof that when your sons grow up, they'll forgive you. When your children grow up, they forgive you. Things, we spend too much time, and I know that's easier said than done, but, uh, but guilt is just, it, it wears you down for sure. I, I think it's not just about hours in time. It's the, you know, it's the, the happiness that you get and the productivity and the, the results that you get in the time. And I, I, I think there has to be that, that give and take. I mean, we're, we're really fortunate to have a company that allows a lot of people to work from home, to work very flexible hours. And so, you know, that may not apply in your circumstance, but it, 
it is about finding a way that you can devote your best time and then say that's enough and uh, or that's as much as I can manage today and and pick it up the next day. Hopefully you work for an employer that understands that. Simone. What I'm going to add to that is that um, I found that balance, it's probably not within a day. I don't, I, I'm, I'm not able within one day to be the best mother, the best manager, the best uh, uh, friend. Um, but if we look more on the mid-long term, your focus will change, right? So maybe you have this project that you have to, believe, to deliver and then you put on the hours on that day, that week, or maybe the weekend. But I think one thing that us women, we benefit is quickly perceive when our kids or our husband needs us. And, and that's where I quickly shift. I, if my daughter needs me, I'll give her the attention at that specific time or I'll help her to overcome a, a challenge. That's where I found my balance. It's not about the hours because I put a lot of hours and, and, and in fact, I actually, I attributed part of my success to the hours that I put. It's not like I have a, a, I mean, a super intelligent or I have all this background. It's, it's a lot about the hours that I put working. But the ability to change the focus when you're most needy, it's, it's where I find my balance. Our next question. Hi. So my question has a bit to do with the vulnerability. Sorry, I'm really nervous right now. <laughs> um, but I work in a very male-dominated industry, a lot of guys who are my dad's age. And trying to be assertive and get things done efficiently a lot of times there's this stereotype that you're like kind of a bitch. It's like, oh, what a bitch. But if a guy is like that, it's like, oh, he's such a go-getter. He's getting things done. So I was just wondering if any of you guys had an experience that really that stereotype came into play and how you handled it. Thank you for your question. Peggy, your words on the B word. <laughs> Have you ever been called it, by the way? Not to my face. <laughs> Probably behind my back. Have I'm you guessing. heard it? Have you heard it in your organization sure. used in that context? Absolutely, and yeah. there's no question. I believe this this stereotype is true, that uh, that men are, that are aggressive and sometimes uh, not very thoughtful in the way that they approach things. People that really men that really dig into something and and uh, work really hard to get there are perceived as uh, differently than women who do the same kinds of things. Um, that, I believe that that's true. I, I think, um, I, you know, I think you gotta do it in your own style, I guess. Uh, I've worked, you know, it's my age, but I, I have worked mostly with men uh, over my entire career. Um, I'm, I work in banking, you know, there's a, thankfully there's a lot of women out there uh, that, that work with me, but, uh, but it is and has been a pretty much male-dominated business. And I think what, what um, it's not an answer for you, but I think what, what women are doing is changing the way business gets done. Not, um, not every time and not, uh, not in every experience. Um, but I think gradually and day to day, we are changing the way business gets done. And I think, um, I think we have to keep putting our hands up and uh, doing things in the way that feels right uh, for us. And, you know, when I heard some of the stories this morning about you know, how vulnerable we can feel and how shame and guilt and all of those emotions, um, they are a part of, uh, of life. They're a part of leadership. And so we just have to find good ways of dealing with them, surrounding yourself with, uh, with truly great people who, uh, who don't seem to think that way. That's great. We have time for just one more question. Here it is. 
Hi, um, my question has to do with career trajectory. Um, are you doing what you thought you would be doing when you graduated school? Is this what you expected? Great question and a great place to finish. Why don't I ask you, Louise, for an answer first? When I graduated from um, university, I was going to be uh, a deputy minister in the Alberta government. <laughs> I think you've but, chosen an easier path. <laughs> you're probably right. Um, what I will tell you, though, is I fell in love with um, organization analysis and people dynamics when I was in university, and I've spent my entire career focusing on that. And so I think, yes, I, I had a plan, but it was based on what I loved and what interests me, not kind of... Didn't, well, I didn't know I'd be a partner at Deloitte, but I did know that I would want to do that kind of work. Simone. I'm actually um, graduated in finance, so yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm at, in my area, but the path to get to here was very different than I would thought when I was uh, younger. Um, I, and I, I would say that what most helped me on this position is my experience in marketing. <laughs> not in finance because all the technicality it's easier to understand than you know real business and and and, and how you um, um, attack a market so I'm I'm at a position or uh, uh, in an area that makes sense for what I graduated for but my path was completely different than what I would thought Peggy, what about for you? This, you said you didn't have a path. What did you think you were going to do when you graduated from school? I had no idea. I, um, as I said, I, I graduated with a master's degree in sociology, which leads you to nothing. Um, <laughs> nothing immediately. Um, I, I was offered an opportunity to stay at university and teach, and I thought maybe that would be good until, believe it or not, this was a sign of my age, but... They, um, what they offered me was an introductory course in the sociology of women. I, I didn't know anything about what that could possibly mean. So I, I took a chance and took a one-year job with the provincial government and ended up staying there for a long, long time. Um, I, I just am one who believes in being open to possibilities. And so I have literally, I gotta tell you, I have fallen into everything that has, uh, that has happened to me in a really good way just by saying, yep, yeah, maybe, maybe I could do that. Maybe, maybe I should try that. Never would have thought, even to this day when a headhunter phoned me to ask about this job and I was running my own business and I said, why would I wanna do that? Um, then gave my head a shake and thought, well, maybe, maybe this is another one of those opportunities, which is in fact what it's turned out to be. So you took your own advice and said, yes. I did. Yes. Well, that is the time that we have. I want to thank you, Peggy, Simone, and Louise, for your insight and your contribution to today. A round of applause for our panelists. It's fantastic.